Paula Drogi, and this is my search for a material soul. A big problem in explaining consciousness is trying to get a grip on exactly what we're trying to explain. It might seem obvious since we're conscious every waking moment, but that's just the problem. We're like a fish trying to see water. It's everywhere, so there's nothing to contrast it with. You actually have to do some Olympic level mental gymnastics to twist yourself into a position where you can distinguish conscious experience from particular aspects of it, such as seeing blue or feeling warm. Those are some contents of consciousness, but what is consciousness itself? So before we get into the reasons that consciousness is not the soul, spend a minute focusing on your conscious experience. Try to empty your mind of particular thoughts, including this video. Remember the gymnastics? So watch the instructions and then pause in order to practice. Notice what you're looking at, how your breath sounds and feels as you inhale and exhale, how your body feels in whatever position you happen to be in. What is it like to be seeing, hearing, and feeling in this way? Answering that question is a start to identifying the sort of consciousness I'll be talking about called phenomenal consciousness. Self-consciousness is different than phenomenal consciousness. When you're self-conscious, you're aware of yourself as having conscious experiences. My instructions to notice your experiences already require a form of self-consciousness. So the trick is to try to get the self out of the picture as much as possible. Olympic level gymnastics. Another Olympic move is to distinguish unconscious sensation from conscious sensation. Since you are not conscious of unconscious sensations by definition, how on earth are you supposed to identify them? Just as you need to try to get the self out of self-conscious experience, you need to get the conscious out of sensation. In both cases, the best way to get a sense of the contrast is after the fact. Just after focused consciousness, I self-consciously reflect on the experience. Just after having an unconscious sensation, I contrast it with the conscious sensation. Here's an example. Body position is usually unconscious. You are having sensations about posture and location and space, because if you weren't, you'd fall over and bump into things. The sensory feedback is automatic, so there is usually no need for these sensations to be conscious. When something goes wrong or a situation is unusual, sensations about body positions become conscious. Maybe you've been sitting too long in one position or you actually are an Olympic gymnast who needs to be acutely aware of the body and space in order to perfectly execute your routine on the uneven bars. Even the gymnast does most actions without conscious control. The point of endless repetition of a routine is to render it routine, habit. For the most part, the body just does what's, what it's been trained to do. Yet a gymnast cannot actually be unconscious. Why not? The ideal mental state is often called the zone, where the focus is not on any specific body movement, but is highly attuned to the overall experience at each moment. The sense of self and the passage of time are lost in the performance of the task. The gymnast is in a heightened state of consciousness, even though she's not conscious of her thoughts or consciously directing her body to do the elements in the routine. She's keeping track of where she is and what she's doing to ensure that everything is going as planned. For the most part, the body just does what it has been trained to do. Consciousness is essential to the gymnast, but it's only a small part of what makes her a gymnast. Otherwise, any of us could be one. Most of her ability is due to talent and training, and these are features of her body and her unconscious brain processes. Consciousness is just the experience you're having right now. All of your memories about the past and skills you learned in the past are encoded in your brain and body. A very limited amount of all those past experiences is part of your conscious experience at this moment. Yet all of those experiences accumulate to be the person that you are. That is the main reason that consciousness is not the soul. Who you are as a person includes far more than your conscious experience. Consciousness is fleeting 
its contents change minute by minute. You change over time too, but your identity is more stable than the contents of your consciousness. I don't think the mind is a computer. Watch my YouTube video, Do We Think Like a Computer? for an argument that the answer is no. Even so, a useful analogy for consciousness is the computer screen. The CPU stores the files and the programs and it processes the information. What you see on the screen is a selection of that information designed to help you figure out what to do next. Keep typing, fix a typo, save the file. The screen isn't doing any work other than to keep you on track. I think consciousness has a similar job. It selects from the incoming information and the stored representations to give you a kind of snapshot of how things are at the moment. And this is where the analogy with the computer breaks down. There is no screen in the brain and no user looking at the screen. Brains just don't work that way. Brains do have interactive neural processes that dynamically integrate representations such as the visual and motor representations of the gymnasts. Consciousness selects representations from all that ongoing processing to provide a kind of snapshot of how things are going at the moment. As noted earlier, a good bit of that processing happens unconsciously. Conscious representations select from these unconscious processes to provide a moment-by-moment -moment update of the current situation in order to keep track of what's happening. There's no need for a user watching a screen. The selected representation just is your conscious experience of the world at this moment. You are the entire unconscious system, including your memories, goals, beliefs, and values. And there are other things too, like your body and your relationships that we'll talk about in the next video on the self. Sigmund Freud compared consciousness to the tip of an iceberg where the vast bulk is below the waterline. Freud was mistaken in characterizing unconscious as the id of repressed desire. There's some of that, no doubt, but so much more of unconscious processing involves quite mundane stimulus response conditioning. Remember the bee dance? Any simple representation like that can be done unconsciously. Walking, eating, even driving a car are largely automated activities. Like the gymnasts, you need to be conscious while doing them, but you don't need to be consciously controlling where your leg moves or how much to turn the steering wheel. Your conscious experience is a monitor. It's not who you are. I could say a lot more about why we need to monitor the current situation and why this sort of representation is the right way to think about consciousness. But I've said all that already in my book, Evolution of Consciousness, Representing the Present Moment. Two points relevant to the search for a material soul are, one, consciousness is not the soul, and two, consciousness can be explained in terms of material processes. First, consciousness cannot be the soul because there's so much more to you than just what happens consciously. What about the second point? Can consciousness be explained in material terms? The answer is yes, but not yet. A great deal of interest and energy and money is being spent looking at brain processes to try to explain consciousness. This research is fascinating and important, but on its own, neuroscience will not produce a convincing explanation. The brain is objective, so the challenge is to show why an objective brain process necessarily produces subjective conscious experiences. David Chalmers has dubbed this the hard problem. To solve it, we need to think more about what the essential features of consciousness are so that we can show how the brain manages to produce just those features. That's why I started out this video with a mini exercise in observing the data from your own private consciousness lab. Pay attention to your conscious experiences. Try to contrast them with self-conscious and unconscious experiences to whatever extent you can. Sample different sorts of experiences doing chores, having a conversation, doing meditation, waking up in the morning. Even altered states like dreaming or hallucination offer clues about what is essential to conscious experience. For the past several years, my introductory philosophy of mind students have been keeping consciousness journals based on this sort of first-person data gathering.
people don't agree about what their observations show. And this disagreement is a serious problem in trying to explain consciousness. There are four main sorts of conclusions people draw about their consciousness, and most of the prominent theories fit into one or another of them. Consciousness is just a sensation. For this group, any response to a stimulus counts as conscious because response indicates sensitivity. On this view, slugs, plants, and slime mold are conscious. Consciousness is a phenomenal representation of the world. This is the view that I've defended here and elsewhere. Conscious experiences are different from unconscious and self-conscious experiences, and they represent the world, including your bodily states, as it is here and now. Consciousness is a matter of representing your sensations and thoughts. Known as a higher order theory, advocates of this view are impressed with the subjective character of consciousness. My conscious states give me information about myself, how the world looks to me rather than to someone else. On this view, consciousness tells me more about me than about the world. Consciousness is an illusion. I'm always surprised at how appealing this view is. There are several different versions. On one theory, consciousness results from talking about sensations and thoughts. On another, consciousness is a hallucination, a unified representation of how the world is expected to be, produced by the process of predicting sensations. A similar theory claims that sensory motor capacities provide a sense of how a person is embodied in the environment, and that is what consciousness involves. Of course, some people argue that consciousness is not material. They look at their conscious experiences and then look at brains and cannot imagine how the one could possibly produce the other. The experience of a blue sky just is nothing like the gray masses of brain tissue. I have already spent a lifetime thinking about how and why consciousness must have evolved from physical processes in order to serve an adaptive function. As I said in an earlier video, if consciousness is not material, then there's no point to search for a material soul. I'm interested in understanding how much of spiritual experience can be explained without invoking anything supernatural. If consciousness is supernatural, then the game is already over. Even if you're not convinced that consciousness can be explained, I hope you continue the search with me for a better understanding of spirituality. Questions remain about how to think about the self and about religious experience like transcendence and destiny. Some of the concepts I've used to explain consciousness, representation, function, will be involved in thinking through these other issues. As we go, you may get more comfortable with the idea that consciousness is a type of representation. In the meantime, keep paying attention to your conscious experiences. It's not as easy as you might think.